Bird Note presents. From Bird Note, this is Bring Birds Back. I'm Tanaja Hamilton. Since I was little, I've loved the movie The Next Karate Kid, starring Hilary Swank. It didn't exactly get critical acclaim, but there is something really cool about a high school girl learning martial arts from the Mr. Miyagi. And that wasn't all she was doing. The emotional core of the film centers around Swank's character, Julie, rehabilitating a Harris's hawk named Angel. At the end, when she releases it back into the wild, I remember having so many questions. That was a real bird, right? Did the bird come back? Does the bird actually have a wounded wing or should we be lobbying for an Oscar nod for this hawk? Fly away, Angel. I guess I wondered, how did filming work for Hillary's feathered co-star? And who was responsible for this on-screen miracle? Well, today, I get to answer those questions and demystify that process with Tony Suffredini, a real-life bird rehabilitator and a big-screen bird handler. Tony Suffredini is known equally in the conservation community and Hollywood. As a generational bird lover, Tony and his twin brother Joe have been influential in both spaces for 25 years now. Tony's expertise in falconry and bird training is used to make birds stars on film and television, but they do just as much for conservation, bird education, and even enviro-friendly abatement, an alternative approach to pest control that Joe pioneered. But more on that later. In this episode, we lean into Tony's world as he shares with us how he approaches this thin line between conservation and the silver screen, and what makes it fulfilling for him and his birds, too. Far off in the land of birds, there lived a bird girl with a bird show. But first, get comfy, grab some popcorn and raisinets, oh, And you might hear sound from Tony's chirpy friends in the background. Enjoy the show. I had uh, the sound crew from the new Planet of the Apes come out. and The apes are falconers in the next movie. Plot twist! (laughs) So they needed a bunch of bird sounds. I'm like, finally it's paying off to have a bunch of noisy birds in my backyard. Anyway. Oh, that's... That's a Rosella you're hearing right now that's beeping like that. Can you tell me more about your birds? Like, I'm curious. What are the personalities here? What are the names? Do we have any divas amongst the mist? Ah, man, I have such an amazing collection of animals that I take care of and that take care of me. Um, I have some canaries. I have a blue crown conure and a black cap kaik that are pretty noisy all the time. And then uh, my African fish eagle is probably the noisiest bird I have. And uh, she spouts off very early in the morning. <laughs> mm-hmm. Has lots of opinions on one. <laughs> My toucan makes a lot of noise. I have a, a white-backed vulture. It's an African bird that I raised from an egg. And that bird has just huge personality and can be a really affectionate. I have a, a golden eagle named Jesus. And uh, actually, I didn't name him. My uncle did. And when Jesus. he... When I first got him, I took him out of his travel box and my uncle said, Jesus, that's a good looking bird. I'm like, that's a good name for him. (laughs) Yeah, sort of this majestic quality about him. (laughs) I don't know what, just it really fits him. He's such a, he's the lord of birds, I suppose. (laughs) I have a a raven that um, is just incredibly intelligent named Edgar and he... um, After... I guess Edgar Allan Poe. (laughs) Yeah. Nevermore. But... um, they're just so incredibly intelligent. And uh, he's got a great personality as well. <laughs> how did you get where you are? Like, how did, how did you begin doing the work that you do? Um, well, I guess it started when I was just a little kid. And my father's a really avid bird watcher. So he drug uh, me and um, my two brothers all over the world looking at different birds that he wanted to see and get on his life list. And my twin brother and I have always really been into animals, all kinds of animals. But the birds were really interesting to us, just the way they live in three dimension and can fly just fascinated us. So um went to school, majored in uh, exotic animal training and management at Moorpark College back in the early 90s. 
graduated in 94 and um, went to work for a wildlife education company down in San Diego and trained animals and um, did wildlife education with them, taught kids about the environment and all that good stuff. Did that for a bunch of years and work for a company called Birds and Animals Unlimited. They do the animal show at Universal Studios, but they also do a lot of studio work. So basically putting animals in front of a camera and uh, training them to do the action prescribed in the scripts. So after working at the show and learning all those different animals and kind of finding my niche with birds, that's what I do now. That is incredibly cool. But I want to take us back a little bit to baby Tony, because you have already mentioned that your dad took you and your brother's around the world kind of looking at birds. And I'm, I'm wondering if you remember what your first profound experience with birds were. Oh, man, yeah, I can remember it like it was yesterday. And I think I was just a little, little kid when it happened. But we were up north, maybe Canada. I don't even remember bird watching. There's this giant gorge, and we were kind of on the rim of the gorge. And my dad pointed out a Peregrine falcon up in the sky circling above the gorge. And uh, as soon as he pointed it out, Another bird, a prey bird, like a flicker. Or I don't even remember the species. It was so long ago. And I watched that falcon do its stoop, came straight down out of the sky, and fastest animal in the world. And it, you could tell it was going fast. And it hit that other bird, and it exploded a big poof of feathers. And <laughs> the peregrine hit that bird so hard it was dead on impact and falling from the sky in the Pergan flipped around midair and grabbed the bird before it hit the ground and flew off with it. Wow. And I was like, oh my God, that was incredible. See, that's so funny because I see that and I'm like <laughs> terrified. I'm trying to become more of a nature girl and we're working through that. But I love how you see that and it immediately sparks this kind of lifelong interest. Just seeing what those birds can do in the wild and how they make a living is just, yeah, it's one of the miracles of nature, really. So you mentioned your father a bit and that he is an avid birder. So can you talk to me a little bit about how your father influenced your decision, if at all, to work with birds? They were very supportive. And it started off by catching, you know, crawdads down in the creek. And then we found a pigeon. I think that was the only bird my parents weren't happy that we got. His name was Lucky because we found him under a bridge. It was just a baby and we raised it up. And uh, pigeons get very, very territorial when they're imprinted by people. And anybody that came to the door, Lucky would swoop down and try to land on their head and just drive them out of there. (laughs) My parents finally got sick of it and they caught the pigeon and took it uh, 20 miles maybe and let it go. And uh, Lucky was home before they were. (laughs) So Lucky was with us for a long time. That was going to be my next question. I was like, did that work? (laughs) And I guess not. No, it it absolutely did not work. And Lucky wasn't a homing pigeon. He was what we call a commie or a common pigeon. But it is uh, obviously innate in them to be able to home just like a homing pigeon. Yeah. As somebody who grew up in New York City around lots of pigeons, I would have never guessed that um, just common pigeons had that in them to kind of imprint and find their people. I think that's what I find so interesting about birds is that imprinting that they do and you can really sort of become part of their family. It's cool that they have so many interesting aspects that allow them to do what they do. So, I mean, with that being said, let's talk about falconry because I've already heard you say that's like, that's your hobby, that's your thing. And I know that it's typically described as the art and sport of training and working with wild birds of prey. But there seems to be so much more to it. So can you just share with me a little bit about falconry and where the practice originated? Oh, boy. (laughs) Puts on your professor monocle. (laughs) It's been around so long. They say 4,000 years people have been training birds. And it's basically how people got food before guns and grocery stores were invented. It's a hunting sport, and back in the day, it was how people got clothing. For example, the Mongolians have a long history, thousands of years of training golden eagles to hunt fox, and they used those fox pelts, and they need those fox pelts to stay warm in Mongolia because I've been there. It's cold. (laughs) Was there a specific moment that made you want to become a falconer? I think the first moment I picked up a bird on the fist and just that feeling of their strength and their beauty, just... I'm like, holy crow, I could, uh, <laughs> I could do this. And 
It's a long process to become a falconer. There's an apprenticeship and you have to take a test and you have to build a facility for your bird and it has to get inspected by uh, fish and wildlife usually. And so that'll make it easy, but um, it's possible for anybody. Probably the hardest aspect is the apprenticeship. You have to find a master general falconer willing to take you on for two years and sort of train you how to work with these birds and keep them safe and healthy. And uh, they're fragile animals in some ways. You know, those feathers are very, very fragile. And if you don't set up their enclosure properly, Properly or keep them properly, then they break just one feather and that puts them at a disadvantage in the wild. So they need every feather they have to perform and catch their prey. One of the many reasons you're really interested on in having you on the show is because you appear to kind of marry your work as a Hollywood handler with the very important work of conservation. And I read that you are a raptor advisor for the nonprofit Wings of Discovery, which is dedicated to the conservation of and education about birds of prey. So can you talk a little bit about the organization and your role in it? Um, Yeah, I'm a director and I sort of specialize in one very individual small niche and that's golden eagles. And so it's my passion to train them and release them back into the wild if possible. And so I get a golden eagle from wildlife rehab. They were brought in for a very different reasons. Every one of them has had their own story and I trained them how to hunt and get in great shape and then I released them. Why um, is education about these birds really important to you? And why do you love golden eagles so much? (laughs) Oh man, they're just the apex predator. I mean, they really are top of the food chain. And I don't know, there's something about an apex predator that uh, is really sexy to me. Like, (laughs) I suppose they make you feel a lot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, geez, they're just such such cool animals. Golden eagles and you know orcas and great whites, just all those top predators just have something special about them that makes them special to me in some ways. These birds deserve human beings not to interrupt their life cycle. And one thing that, that I'm passionate about is how bad rodenticides are for our wildlife and not just birds of prey, but birds of prey seem to suffer the most from rodenticides. And for you guys out there that don't know what a rodenticide is, it's rat poisoning. And they always have a secondary, even a third cycle of killing. So the rat dies, something eats that rat, whatever eats that rat dies. And then sometimes whatever eats what ate the rat and eats that dies. I don't know if I did that too many times, but basically rodenticide sucks. And if I could educate people on that, that'd make me feel good. I think we save a lot of creatures if people stopped using uh, rat poisoning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I definitely don't want to leave your brother and business partner, Joe Sefardini, out of this conversation. How could you? (laughs) How could I, right? You you literally look alike. You're twins. So- can't have one without the other. I'm um, older. I'm 20 minutes older. I never let him forget that. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm sure he never lives that down. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I tell him back when I was your age, and then I tell him what I was doing 20 minutes ago. <laughs> that's a, that's it's my a only great twin one. choke. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Well, the both of you are pioneers in using raptors as a natural, environment-friendly form of abatements at landfills. I've heard you call your brother the dumpster king king of the dumps king of the dumps <laughs> poetic honestly beautiful um and i read that landfills are required by law to scare birds away which is why they hire falconers like you two so can you tell us a little bit more about your business sky patrol abatement caca <laughs> caca that's the that's the motto no tagline just caca you have to say that after every time. That's fine. You have to say it every time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my brother really uh, really came up with this concept of keeping seagulls out of the landfills using falcons. And, um, well, the reason landfills are required to keep seagulls out of... Actually, there's no such thing as a seagull, by the way. Take one step back. Wait. <laughs> there's silver... Are there's... You about to, you're about to change the way I think about something that I've known for my entire life. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, my this is my dad's thing. You would say, "Oh, look at the seagull," and he would be like, "There's no such thing as seagull," and everybody would be like, "Why?" And he'd be like, "Well, there's silver gulls, and there's laughing gulls, and there's herring gulls, but there's not one seagull. There's a bunch of different species of seagulls. Basically, not one of them is called a seagull." Segue into why landfills don't want gulls at their fill is because the gulls will eat the trash, and then they they always roost on water at night. And so 
whether it be a stream down the street or the ocean or any body of water, they're basically taking that garbage out of the landfill and polluting waterways with it. And so that's why seagulls are not allowed at the landfill. Yeah, I was going to say, so where do y'all come in? Well, um, a falcon is, they only eat other birds. It's like seeing a great white in the in the ocean. When the seagull sees the falcon flying around, they, they leave town because they're in big trouble and they know it. And so it's a really ecological and environmental way of keeping seagulls out of the garbage. They don't catch many seagulls, almost never, unless the seagull isn't paying attention at all. But they fly away and that's what we want them to do, go back to the, a more natural food source. Yeah, so uh, instead of bringing the trash back to the ocean or wherever they roost, they can go and talk about this near-death experience they just had with right. the falcon. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. <laughs> it is interesting. I mean, they're fairly intelligent birds themselves. And so they, after a few exposures to the falcon, they'll recognize the falconer's truck and take off before you even get a falcon out of the truck. Whoa. That is very cool and also very effective. Yeah, we call it trauma learning. That's, uh, they start connecting the dots pretty quickly that that white truck means uh, flying death. For um, anybody who a gull has ever stole a french fry from on the beach, this is like, oh yeah, there, there's, there's some ideas cooking. I already know. Payback. I got to become a falconer. I have to hire a falconer. <laughs> Playing a long game. Right. <laughs> so I want my fry back. Exactly. <laughs> What are the advantages of using birds of prey as a form of deterrence versus the other options? What are the other options? Uh, yeah, the other options are not great. Usually it, it involves like noisemakers, compressed air cannons, or even pyros, like bird whistlers, these basically firecrackers. You shoot at them. What else? They've tried fake owls or fake coyotes to sort of deter the gulls from landing in the garbage and eating. Kind of like scarecrows. Scarecrows, yeah, and then they stretch wire and tie mylar over the face. All that stuff involves setup, and it's not very effective, but uh, a falconer can move around and expose these seagulls or gulls. Sorry. <laughs> Telling your dad. <laughs> To this predator and they basically set up a presence and pretty soon, like you said, they'll tell their friends and the landfill will be free of gulls, at least for a little while. But you get like migration. So that's interesting too, just watching how these gulls move around the planet. And there aren't very many gulls to just live in one area. They, they migrate and move. So yeah, seeing sort of different waves of different species come through and keeping them out of the garbage is kind of rewarding, I guess. Mm. How long does it take for the seagulls to kind of like pick it up? It's like, this is not, you're not welcome. I meant the gulls. No seagulls. I meant the gulls. How long does it take the gulls? <laughs> the gu yeah, watch it, lady. <laughs> um, well, it depends on time of year. Sometimes when it's when it's really cold out, for example, those gulls are driven to eat and they know that the landfill is a source of food. And so you got to work a lot harder when it's cold out during the winter and raining when it's harder for them to find their own natural food than they go to unnatural sources. Next up, Master Falconer Tony fills us in on a research project his feathered family assisted with. And finally, we learn all about how to be a successful bird and bird trainer in Hollywood. But first, a short break. So a little bit of a left turn, but we also found your name attached to this very interesting scientific study that was published in 2017, attempting to understand a mystery that is soaring birds. And it mentioned that, and this is a direct quote, soaring birds can balance the energetic cost of movement by switching between flapping, soaring, and gliding flight. And that accelerometers can allow quantification of flight behavior and thus a context to interpret these energetic costs. Those were a lot of words, but basically you help scientists study the best methods of recording and analyzing bird acceleration. The paper mentioned that it was a unique opportunity due to your ability to handle the birds. But can you tell us about that experience and have you participated in other studies before or after? 
Yeah, that was a that was a really cool experience, and it it wasn't just the figuring out the how they fly in an air column. It was also to help mitigate the wind turbine industry that puts these wind turbines up in these areas that are high migration route. Usually, if it's a nice windy canyon, then usually there are birds that are flying through it on their migration path. So the USGS contacted me and asked me if I was interested in flying my golden eagle in some different areas and putting an accelerometer on the bird's back to get an idea of how a bird flies, basically. And um, yeah, so we went up to these um, really remote areas where they had proposed wind turbine sites, and I flew my eagle there, and uh, he flew really, really well, and they got a lot of really cool data, and I met some really cool scientists that were doing great work, and I think I'm the only non-doctorate listed on that scientific paper. <laughs> so that was, I was like, hey, can you put in like a... Uh, Master Eagle Falconer, that would that would help me feel a little bit better about my role in this <laughs> science. And if you could also end it with caca, that would be great too. Just, I want to know, I want to be known as the caca person professionally. <laughs> somehow get that in there, please. No, it was a cool uh, cool experience, and um, I really appreciate being able to do science like that. It's helping birds out, and it's you know science. It's really cool. We actually. Um, have just talked to folks who work kind of in the wind turbine field and they told me such interesting things about how these soaring birds, they really kind of play in those areas. They play, they kind of glide, they do all these things and have these behaviors. So it's really cool to hear the other side of that, which is you providing the bird and talking about like how well the bird flew and how that information is going to be used to kind of fuel conservation efforts. Yeah, yeah, please. Every every golden eagle is a good save, man. They're just such special animals. Falconry allows important work like bird conservation and enviro-friendly pest control to be done by trained and vetted individuals like Tony and his brother Joe. Combating environmental threats like gulls polluting waterways with garbage from landfills and golden eagle conservation are no easy feats. Tony's specialized skills in training golden eagles how to hunt and live in the wild are super beneficial to these rare birds. As Tony mentioned, falconry permits are issued by your state's local fish and wildlife department following two years of study and requirements. In the face of steep bird population decline, falconry certainly has its own particular role in conservation. Tony's love for birds is why he's chosen to cultivate a career working with them. It's clear that he intentionally gives back through falconry, conservation, and abatement, but he seems to find the most joy in befriending and training his birds for film and television. Tony's birds have appeared in movies such as The Dark Knight, The Proposal, and Evan Almighty. Something he refers to as new experiences and environments for his bird buddies. So how does one even begin to train a bird? You have to do your due diligence and desensitize them to cameras, to lights, to... um you know, everything that goes on in a movie set that can be different than what they see on an every day. And so my job is to them not know the difference between every day and a movie set. So I literally take my animals everywhere with me and get them used to everything that I can. And that makes for a better bird and stress-free. But if you have a bird that's never seen a camera to them, it looks like a big one-eyed monster coming right at them. So I think that's the difference between like, you know, someone's pet bird and uh an animal that's very specially trained to work in front of the camera. When you say you take your animals everywhere, where is everywhere? I want to I wanna imagine this. <laughs> uh, well, you can't exactly fly a falcon in your front yard or backyard. You got to take them out to different fields and stuff. So the very first thing that's important to an animal that works in front of a camera, whether it be a dog or an eagle, it has to be used to traveling. And then when we get to some place, we take them out and reward them for the behaviors and then we just start adding we call it distractions so whether that be a stranger that's like a big one for some birds i have a bird that's like still really wary of strangers even though <laughs> the stranger danger is strong with that one <laughs> yeah yeah no, but um that's just something to know in their behavior oh well she doesn't like strangers or she doesn't like people moving so when i have her on set i'm like nobody move everybody holds very still and and then just take my time introducing her to the people that are going to be involved with her in the shot just knowing their behavior and knowing what could scare them that's the worst case scenario is something scares them and then they don't want to work on set anymore so yeah we're just super careful with our animals to make sure that uh 
nothing scares them and you can never uh, make it 100% positive. But some of that negative stuff can turn into positive stuff. So if it was always happy glory, then they wouldn't be learning anything. If I came in the set and, you know, someone fired up a fan and they weren't expecting it. And, but then I was able to pay them for being calm when the fan turned on and that turns into something that they're learning. And they learn as much from not being successful as they do from being successful. So I know that most of the worry around having birds on film and television sets is the number of hours needed to complete a day's work, right? So would love if you could share with us what a work day looks like for birds. We try to limit the schedule to how long they're on set. I just tell production straight up, hey, if you want the best performance out of this animal, it's best to bring us in as close to when you're going to shoot it as possible. It's rare that an animal works on set all day long. If they were going to have falcon action, for example, all day long, then I would have a team of falcons. A team of like... Always have a team of them. Bird uh, yeah. understudies. Yeah, um, yeah. So when you're on set, what kinds of rules and guidelines do you have to follow? If you look at most uh, films at the end, you'll see a disclaimer with a stamp, no animals are harmed in the making of this film. And so the movie sets that I work on have an animal safety uh, representative. There's a, an organization called American Humane, and they always have a representative on set who's read the script, knows the action, and is there to make sure that the animal is safe and happy and that there's no action that um, that is dangerous for the animal. Or if it is dangerous for the animal, that all the training and safety precautions are in place. American Humane, which Tony appreciates for their support on set, was founded back in 1877 to monitor and encourage the proper treatment of animals. The Hollywood Division for Film and Television wasn't established until 1940, following a pretty horrific death of a horse on set. By 1941, American Humane began observing animal relations on the majority of Hollywood's film productions. They eventually established their Guidelines for the Safe Use of Animals in Film Media, which requires supervisors from the association to be on set whenever animals are present to monitor and qualify the production for their now famous in credit, No Animals Were Harmed. The line only appears on eligible films and TV shows with its first appearance in The Doberman Gang in 1972. To be clear, the guidelines are actually the responsibility of the producers on each project, not the trainers or the handlers, as many might believe. And they're written in layman's terms, so literally anyone can follow them. Like, for birds, it states that if they're underweight, overweight, or physically deemed unfit by the supervisor, they will not be allowed on set. Which sounds a little weight shamey, but really it's not about the bird's appearance. It's to make sure the bird isn't so hungry that it flies off to hunt for food, or so full that the bird isn't motivated by the promise of a snack to do its job. Other standards prohibit the practice of de-beaked birds, flying birds after dark, and subjecting birds to inclement weather, including extreme heat, cold wind, and humidity, to name a few. Tony shared that working in tandem with American Humane always lessens the pressure for him on set. Yeah, I mean, it just had happened on, on set a few weeks ago out in New Mexico, and they had some crows. They were supposed to be sitting on a body, pecking at a dead body, and they had like... <laughs> a burning wagon and the trees were on fire and there was real smoke and there was fake smoke. And uh, I took one look at the set and I looked over at the humane rep and she's like, I don't think it's safe for birds. And I was like, I don't think it's safe for birds. And so, yeah, they cut the birds out of the shot and put them in a different one that didn't have the same uh, atmosphere is what we call it. Mm, it seems like at the very least, it's good to kind of have an ally in that protecting the birds because it's obvious that you care so much about the birds and their well-being on set. So having somebody who can help call these potentially dangerous situations out helps to keep everyone, including our feathered friends, safe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are absolutely an ally for my animals. So yeah, I wouldn't want to be on set without them. And besides that, I don't want anything happen to my animals. So I take a ton of precautions as well. Has there ever been um, a request for a bird that you are like, Absolutely not. Like either this logistically can't work or 
I don't know, I guess in my mind, I'm thinking about um, everyone's favorite bird uh, on the internet, the harpy eagle, which right. looks like a human in a costume. And that <laughs> right. would be an absolute no for me. So I'm just curious if you've ever been like, I'm going to pass. Right. I have a bird that's very similar to the harpy eagle. It's called a crowned eagle. I just got the bird fairly recently in the last year or so. And um, I got a request for putting this bird in front of a camera for a stills thing. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. It's a, a lot to ask for this bird. They wanted it flying to capture some like slow mo flying stuff. It was going to happen on a stage. And so I am and hot about it and I recommend a different behavior that might be a little bit easier or um, safer for the bird. Sometimes there's action that you're like, oh, that's asking a lot of a bird. So yeah, it's just a, a give and take a little bit on stuff like that. So you've already mentioned how you're regulated on sets with animals. And I think a lot of people have an idea about the conditions on sets for animals and that they could be cruel or unethical. And um, I'm glad that we already addressed how there's kind of like protections built in, there are reps there to ensure that's not the case. But what would you say to people with this assumption that is like inherently unethical to use animals in, in productions? Well, uh, the movie industry is in a lot of ways a reflection of human, the human condition, and I'm, I'm just there to make their art a reality. The conditions on set for the animals, like I said, are it's all about the animal's safety. So, yeah, just rest assured that the animals are safe and not being abused in any way. Do you believe that the animals benefit from their participation in Hollywood as well? Oh, definitely. I mean... I just see how happy the animals are. They're just so excited to see new people and they're the center of attention and they know it. And most animals really enjoy that, especially if it's, you know, through positive reinforcement. And there are some animals that just don't have the aptitude for film and those you will not see in front of a camera, at least not with me working them. Mm. I'm not in Hollywood, but I've always, I've grown up hearing like, you don't work with children, you don't work with animals. And you not only work with animals, you work with animals that can fly, which is like another level. Have there been any kind of challenging situations you've had on set that threw you for a loop? Or now that you're kind of like out of the situation, it's like, thank God, curious about that. Yeah, the thing about animals is they, they learn something very slowly compared to people. You can't just tell them something. You have to show them and train them. So yeah, just changing of the scripts is annoying to me just because the animals don't understand. And so I have to take a step back and tell them it's going to take some time to work through it right now or we can't do it and we'll have to uh, revisit it when we have time to train it. And so usually they'll go back to their original script when I tell them that. Before we wrap up, is there anything else that folks, our audience should know about the work you do and just the conservation efforts, but also just, you know, movies, Hollywood, anything? I really do enjoy my work and uh, it's it's a challenge and um, every day is different. And I just love the, the relationships I'm able to make with these birds and animals. That's important for them to be um happy and comfortable working means that I get to spend a ton of time with some of the coolest animals and have just a really unique relationship with every one of them and uh, really get to know them so that I can work them as efficiently and as safely as possible. So we're trying this new game called Bird Association. Um, and essentially, I have a couple of rapid fire questions for you. So um, what is your favorite movie you've ever worked on? Um... It's hard. There's been a lot of really fun ones. I worked on a movie called um, Zookeeper. That was shot in Boston with Kevin, Kevin James, mm -hmm. KJ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul Blart, Mall Call Up. What is your favorite bird call? I think probably one of my favorites is uh, the red tail scream. It's a territorial call. They have, you know, like a high pitch, you know, whistle, and you'll hear it a lot in in movies. No matter what bird. <laughs> If it's a bird of prey, they'll put the red tail call, you know, when they when they see it, you know. Come on, guys. <laughs> Hello. I know that's not the bird. Nobody else knows except falconers. They're like, that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't a red tail. And my last question for you, what is your favorite place to bird watch around the world? Well, I was in uh 
Belize this summer with my brothers. My whole family went and uh, we did some, we had some amazing bird watching. We saw these uh, orange breasted falcons, which are critically endangered species. And just that environment, that jungle environment was just amazing. And the fishing was really good too. So, <laughs> truly a jack of all trades. Well, Tony, this conversation was super fun. I learned a lot. Thank you so much, Tony. You're welcome. The glitz and glam of Hollywood certainly looks different from a bird's eye view. Many thanks to Tony Suffredini for teaching us all about his bird world, from falconry and pest control to the big screen. For more on Tony's work with birds, falconry, and American Humane, go to birdnote.org. And don't forget to connect with us, your favorite friendly bird lovers, on Instagram at bringbirdsback. Follow us for show updates, exclusive behind-the-scenes content, and more. Bring Birds Back is produced by Mark Bramhill, Sam Johnson, and me, Tanaja Hamilton. Our fact checker is Connor Guerin. Our managing editor is Jazzy Johnson, and our content director is Joe Nice Franklin. Music is by Cosmo Sheldrake and Blue Dot Sessions. But, um, yeah, he can do anything a dog can do and, and better. He, they're just so incredibly intelligent. And uh, he's got a great personality as well. I, I was going to say, I know this is a bird podcast, but that's a really bold claim. Anything a... A dog can do. A dog can do. Yeah, better, actually, because he can fly, too. A dog can't. <laughs>